About two years ago, I embarked on a very special project, which I named the Blue Glove Project. I had some ideas and concepts in my head, which I was really trying to experiment and try out. It was all about setting up an automated watering system for my carnivorous plants. Well, I'm happy to say that overall, it was a resounding success. Of course, there was a lot of things that I learned along the way. There were some things that worked, some that didn't work like I expected, but overall, I was happy with the results. And this is what this video is all about. I'm gonna be discussing in more detail what the Blue Project involved and what worked and what didn't work. Hopefully, you can get some of the ideas and concepts in this video to help you set up your very own automated watering system at home. It's all about getting more of your time back and spending more time with your carnivorous plants or any plants for that matter. Okay, so I'm gonna go over the concept behind the Blue Glove project. So the idea that I had in my head was to experiment uh, using a wicking system to water my carnivorous plants. So basically a wick is anything which absorbs water through capillary action. It's a bit like when you put tissue into a tray of water, the water will start to uh, rise into the tissue through capillary action. And here I used polyester fibres as a wicking material which I sourced from Yacht Rope. So the whole idea was to have the one end of the wicks sitting in some water, which is going to be contained in the PVC pipes. The other end of the wicks were inserted into the base of the pots where the plants were. So the wicks, wicks basically acted like a bridge by transferring that water through capillary action into the plants sitting above the PVC pipes. So why did I even consider using PVC pipes for the Blue Glove project? I love the fact that PVC pipes are very modular. You can arrange the sections and cut the sections to whatever way you like to suit your circumstances at home. This is a T in a section here and this is a 90 degree connector there. So they all come off so you can Arrange the PVC pipes any way you like, so that's really cool. PVC pipes are quite inexpensive and they're very readily available. I got these from my local hardware store. By the way, these pipes are 90 millimeters in diameter. And of course, PVC pipes are designed to store water, so so long as the connectors are waterproof or watertight, then you shouldn't have any leaks. So I consider this to be the heart of the Blue Glove project, the heart of the automatic watering system. This is a float valve and I had that inserted into the PVC pipe lengthwise. I'll get to that in a second how I did that but the way it works is that when the water level is high that float goes up therefore turning off that valve and therefore stopping that water coming in. As soon as that water level goes down, that float goes down, therefore opening that valve and therefore letting in water. That's how the float valve works. So it's important that you have your PVC pipes relatively level. They don't have to be 100%, but for this to work effectively, your PVC pipes need to be level. So how did I have this float valve arranged in the pipes. So this Tina section here is the section that I used. I love the fact that you, you've got access from the top, which allows you to do maintenance on the float valve or adjust it if you need to. I actually found that once I set all this up, I never needed maintenance, but this is the section that I used. And basically I inserted the float valve lengthwise into the T intersection. And the top there, you can buy these screw caps that have got a rubber seal on there, so it's nice and waterproof. That just nicely screws on like that. So it just gives you access when you 
need to to that float valve. So how do I actually secure this float valve? Well, I did that by attaching it to an end cap. So this end cap, it's a special type of end cap which sits snugly to the end of that T intersection. You're gonna have to provide some sort of waterproof connection there between the end cap and that T intersection. But I basically just drill the hole to the desired height. I inserted that through that hole and the way I secure it, there's a plastic washer here that comes off. So that comes off like that. Once that's through like that, through the other side, you then secure it by screwing on this plastic washer. So not only does it secure it to that end washer, but it also secures, it, secures that float uh, valve at the desired height, which is really important. Now, I'm just gonna show you, give you a few tips now about setting the height of that float valve. So it's important, so right now the float valve is open because it's flat and when the water level goes up that turns off. So when, you, when you're setting the height, you want that float valve to have enough clearance to turn off when it needs to, so it needs to have that vertical height. At the same time, you don't want it the fly valve to be right on the bottom there because it's not gonna regulate the proper water level. You need water level in there for the wicks to sit in. So what I suggest is to have that float valve sort of in the middle there, okay? You want that actual float itself, not the part where the water level comes in because that's higher up. You want that sort of in the middle there like this. So that's gonna provide water depth, sufficient water depth for those wicks. At the same time, it's gonna give you that vertical clearance for the float valve to turn off the water supply. Now also, when you're doing this, trying to figure out the right height of the float valve, just take note of where that water inlet valve is. So just try to take note of where it is on that end cap. So that gives you a bit of an idea about where to drill that hole. So I reckon looking at that, it's probably about a centimetre from the top of that end cap. So now it's just a matter of drilling that hole in that end cap. So to... So to work out what diameter of drill bit to use, just simply line it up against the thread of the float valve. And that looks around about right, so I'll be using this drill bit to drill the hole. So I've marked it here to be about a centimetre from the top of that end cap. So that's where I'm going to drill the hole. So here's the hole in the end cap. All I've got to do now is secure the float valve. So I've taken off the plastic washer. Just going to insert the thread part through that hole like that. And then I'm going to secure it by threading on the plastic washer. Like so. Now, next thing you've got to do is you have to just sort of line up that float valve until it's in the center. Yep, I'm pretty happy with that. I'm just going to tighten that up. And that's what it looks like. That's where the water comes in. And of course, that's where the float valve is. Okay, to work out the section of PVC pipe that I'm going to have to cut out, it's just a matter of lining up the float valve with the 
vertical space above it. So you sort of want that whole section of float sort of below that vertical space like in here. It helps to have something on either side of the pipe to stop it from rolling over. It just makes it a lot easier to measure up. So just move that until you can see it below that vertical space. And with the other hand, just move the flow valve up and down. Oh, that's a little bit too close. Let's try that again. That looks about right. As you can see, there's not much clearance here, but once you get this right, you won't have to worry about this again. So that looks around about, that there looks around about right. And when I use my tape measure, it works out to be around about seven centimeters. Hopefully you can see that measurement there, around about seven centimeters. So just try one more time with that float valve. Yep, it looks like it's going up. There's no impediment there for that float. So I'll have to cut out seven centimeters of pipe. So here I'm just marking seven centimeters on the PVC pipe. It helps to have multiple markings all around it just to guide you where to cut it. Just keep it going around the pipe. So what you got to do here guys, the best way to do this is to just lightly run your blade over those markings and at the same time just roll the section of pipe. Just keep going along those markings, that's why I put those multiple markings in there just to give you give me a good guide as I'm going around the pipe. You can see that there's slowly but sure there's a faint scratch there. So just keep going around like this. Then as it gets deeper, just do a little bit. Run your blade through it a bit more. Helps to clean that blade up every now and again. But just continue doing what you were doing before. And then just keep going around it. And eventually, You should end up with a pretty straight and accurate section cut out. Okay, so now start to follow those edges to smooth them out. Got this rounded file here. So there's a section of pipe cut out. Pretty happy with it. It's quite straight. And the edges are nice and smooth. So now we're ready to put it in and line up that float valve. So now we're going to put that section into the T-piece. Just make sure all the dust is off. Just put that in there like that. Just make sure that the edge is all the way into the end of that um, space there. Looks pretty close up. And then I'm going to put in the float valve and hopefully it's going to line up. Make sure it's nice and firm all the way to the edge. Just have a look here to make sure that it's on the 
in the middle there. So it'll be just adjusted a bit. That looks about right. And now for the big test, let's see whether this goes all the way up without impediment. Yep, and that looks about right. Happy with that. So there we have it, our float valve canister. So, so far we've built the float valve canister with the top screw on lid of course, in case you need access to that float valve. You've got your RO filtration supply hose, water supply hose, connected to the float valve via the adapter that I showed you earlier. And the way I've set up my RO system, I'll be discussing in my next video, which will be coming around shortly. And connected to the float valve housing will be, of course, the PVC pipes, which are going to be containing the water for the wicks. So next, I'm going to be discussing how I was able to insert those wicks into those pipes containing the water. So here's a snapshot of how I had my setup with my pipes. You'll notice that pipe leading into the T section, that there's a gap on top of the pipe. That's actually where I was putting in the wicks. Now, I achieved that gap by cutting two uh, cuts using a jigsaw. Whilst it did work, it was very time consuming and it was very, very messy. Looking back, it would have been better for me just to use a drill using a large arb or drill bit. Now these drill bits are basically just a normal drill with a circular uh, drill bit attached. And it's just a matter of lining up your pots where they're going to be sitting on the pipe, marking the centre of those pots and then drilling where the centre markings are. Now, here's another thing guys, after you've cut into these pipes, whichever way you do it, make sure that the edges of those cuts are smooth. That's to prevent the wicks from catching onto those um, sharp edges. And the way you smooth them out is simply by using a file or you can just use sandpaper. That's the way that I was able to achieve those smooth edges when cutting into those pipes. So what's the best way to sit your pot plants on top of the pipes? Here's a snapshot of how I had my setup. I had, you can see where that green, cream coloured garden screen material is, and that's sitting on the PVC pipes. And that garden screen material was able to um, allow the wicks to go through and through to the pipes. Now looking back, it, whilst it did work, um, that's not cheap, that um, garden plastic screening. And not only that, um, it started to warp a little bit around the edges. So uh, it was quite hard to try and keep it flat. And of course you want to keep it nice and flat um, over those pipes because um, you don't want those wicks sort of lifting up out of the water. So what I found, again, looking back, that was one of the um, lessons that I learned. What probably would have been better is to have your pots sitting directly on top of the PVC pipes. So you can't just put them on like that. They're going to fall off. But I was thinking, I've got some old pots that I got from a nursery. And what I did was I just basically cut out the bottom section of that pot and... I've just drilled a hole down the bottom, fold around the edges using the um, arbor drill bit that I showed earlier. And what, probably what would have been better is to just sit them, sit this bottom part on top of the pipe, probably secure it using double-sided tape. And then I could have just got my pots and just directly sit them on top like that. And that would have held those pots in place. And of course, if I wanted to ever take them out, you can just take them out and put another one in there if you want. But that probably would have been better. It would have been quicker. Um, it would have been cheaper. And it would have been a lot less um, work uh, than installing that screen material because I had to cut it to size. Um, I had to also screw it on to the wooden planks that were going over the P 
PVC pipes as well. So it was a lot of work, but looking back, it probably would have been better just to use this arrangement right here. So let's start talking about providing a watertight connection between the PVC sections. So at the time when I was thinking about this concept and about the Blue Glove project, COVID started. And I noticed that I was using a lot of blue latex gloves being disposable. I was throwing them out at a, on a regular basis. So one time after coming home from work, I thought to myself, is there any way that I could reuse those gloves? So after looking at some of the PVC pipes, I was able to get one of those gloves around the edges there because they're quite elastic. And after fitting in the sections and pouring water in there, to my surprise, I noticed that the connections were actually watertight. So I was very, very happy to know that um, I could reuse something I was about to throw away. So that's the reason why I came up with the name, the Blue Glove Project, because of those blue latex gloves. So you may be wondering why latex? Well, I know that um, latex is inert when it's in water, it doesn't release any uh, chemicals or any um, substances into the water. So I thought that might be a good material to try and connect those pipes. Um, carnivorous plants, I know um, if you can sort of reduce any sort of dissolved salts or any sort of contaminants in the water, the better it will be for the plants because they're quite sensitive. So that's the reason why I came uh, across and thought about using blue latex gloves. So that video segment that you just saw is from a previous video that I did detailing how I actually applied those blue latex gloves to provide that watertight fit. So the link to that video is in the comment section. So if you want to have a look, go and have a look at that video. Of course, you can always use PVC cement. So that's the stuff that they normally use to connect the pipes. Not only is it secure, but it also provides a watertight fit. Now, strangely enough, I didn't actually test out the water using PVC cement. I was so sort of fixated on using those blue latex gloves, but it may be worth a go just um, you know, trying out using a TDS meter, which, dissolve, which measures the dissolved salts in the water um, if you're using PVC cement. It may be okay and it may be inert after it dries. So um, that's definitely worth a, a, a go. Um, and it's, it would be sort of uh, nice to know that those pipes are secure and, and uh, waterproof at the same time. So this is the tool that I use to insert the wicks into the base of the pots. I just basically got some wire from a local hardware store and um, I doubled it over and then I attached one into a drill and I just turned that drill and then ended up making this tool here. You can see how it's open-ended on one side, which is what you need. Now, the way that I insert these wicks, I basically get a section of wick material so in this case it's polyester fibers just dip it in water just makes it easier to work with it's more pliable that way as well and then i just basically put it into the open-ended section like that then i just double that over then you get your pot, turn the pot upwards, just to the side a bit like that, and then just insert that tool into one of the gaps there in the base of your pot and just push that in, like so. Once you've done that, just pull your tool out. And that should come out cleanly, leaving the wick nicely inserted into the base of the pot. And now all you've got to do is just have that other end of the wick sitting in some water. So how effective were these wicks at watering my carnivorous plants? Well, I'm glad to say that overall, 
it was a resounding success. Most of the plants were happy. They received the moisture through these wicks, and as a result, they grew really well. In fact, some of my best looking plants were as a result of using this capillary system of watering. Now, the types of plants that I used using this capillary system was Venus flytraps, North American pitcher plants, sundews, and I even still use this technique for watering my Albany pitcher plants. Now, what I really love about this uh, wicking system is that, that it provides constant moisture to the growing medium where the plants are growing, and the plants do the rest at pulling moisture through their roots. Now, what I were, found out that it didn't work so well, this wicking system was for large plants like this North American pitcher plant. Now, this is a three-year-old plant, and as you may see, it's quite cramped in its pot. This should have been divided a long time ago. So as a result, there's a lot of rhizomes in there, and there's less peat moss. So I worked out sort of the reason why it's not as effective is because there's less peat moss in there. There's more rhizomes displacing that peat moss. And as a result, it becomes less effective at pulling that water through capillary action through these wicks. Now, if I was to have one or two rhizomes in there, that should be no problem. But when it's cramped, and especially a plant like a North American pitcher plant, which is quite thirsty for water, this capillary wicking system is less effective. Now, just something to be aware of, guys, there, okay? Now, just uh, pot sizes. Um, this is a 140 millimeter high plastic pot. This is a 20 millim 200 millimeter high plastic pot. So they're the pot, si pot sizes that I used during my Blue Glove project. Now, another thing that I realized through experimentation is that after a certain height above the water source, the capillary system of watering becomes less effective. So I've worked out that 20 centimeters above the water source is the maximum. You should have your pot plant. After that, the wicking system becomes less reliable and less effective. So that's why it's important to have your pot plant as close as possible to those PVC pipes containing the water. So you guys may be wondering, am I actually applying all the ideas and concepts that I learned from the Blue Glove project? Well, the answer is I am to some extent. As I said earlier, I'm still using these wicks to water my cephalotus or Albany pitcher plants. Now, um, Albany pitcher plants are notorious for being overly watered and using this system over here, it provides that nice constant moisture without over watering the plants and they're very, very happy. They seem to be growing really well. And this is despite having torrential rain here over the last 12 months. We've been getting this La Nina and there's been a lot of moisture coming from the top and yet this wicking material and the capillary action works wonders for the cephalotus. But it's not only cephalotus that this technique works for. As I said earlier, it's worked all well for my other carnivorous plants and I'm sure it will work well for other types of non-carnivorous plants as well. Now, what the reason why I don't use the wicking material overall is that I learned very quickly is that inserting wicks into the base of the pot plants is very time consuming. And I simply have too many plants for this to be time efficient for me. So that's why I have my pot sitting in a uh, pond lighter filled with uh, water. But for you guys at home who have a small collection of plants, this may just be the ticket. And um, it's just nice to know that your plants are well watered. It's, it's a very constant way of providing moisture to the plants, to the growing medium. And the plants do the rest by absorbing all the moisture that they need. And what I really love about this is that depending on how many wicks you have sitting in the base of the pot, you can provide different levels of moisture to the plant depending on the plant's care requirements. So it's a very versatile way of watering your plants. Now, when it comes to the float valve, uh, that's something that I really learned a lot about in that Blue Glove project. I still apply that now at my nursery. Uh, as you may know, I've got my plants growing on a wooden platform. And in that wooden platform, I have a 
float valve which regulates the level of the water in there and of course that valve is connected to my reverse osmosis filtration system. So thanks for watching guys and hopefully you've learned something new today. Hopefully you can apply some of the techniques discussed in this video to help you set up your very own automatic watering system at home for your garden. You know, to me it's all about getting more of your valuable time back and spending more time in your garden. And there's something very satisfying about making something yourself. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. Please subscribe and don't forget to click the bell icon to receive notifications of my next video. So until next time everyone, happy growing.